I no offense, but visual hallucinations are pretty heavy duty to shit. Right? So yeah. like that yeah. is not yeah. a usual childhood experience <laughs> for most Welcome to Only Ghosting, a podcast by three moms who left evangelicalism. I'm Lindsay, and I am the senior warden at an Episcopal church in Portland, Oregon. I am Meg, and I am currently figuring it out. And I'm Sarai, and I'm a fucking witch. On today's episode, Panic at the Altar, Mental Health and the Evangelical Church. Are you ladies ready to get going? Very much so. So ready. So I was diagnosed with anxiety when I was 40. Definitely had it my entire life and was told to pray it away more often than not. Um, I think I'm having a panic moment right now, actually, (laughs) just um, thinking about talking about anxiety and how much as a child I was denied any kind of support. Um, I think I think my mom did the best she could supporting me through prayer and laying on of hands and, you know, sending things through the prayer chain. Mm -hmm. When do you remember hearing the term anxiety? Like, was it called anxiety when you were younger? Oh, no, no. I think it was called a spirit of fear. (laughs) (laughs) I know that term. (laughs) I do. (laughs) Um, Second Timothy 1, 7, Mm. for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And I think when you're a kid and you're told that and you're dealing with anxiety, I don't I don't think it brings much comfort. I think what it ended up doing for me was giving me a lot of personal doubt and realizing like I must not be a good Christian. I must not be a good enough girl for God to listen to me or for God to actually come and help me. I'm curious when you thought of that verse, the concept of a spirit of fear, how did you conceptualize that spirit? Was it like, it's a spirit, like a demon in me? Or was it like, it's, uh, my spirit is like this as a person, like it's my personality to be fearful or something. Oh no. I mean, my personality was meant to be good. And that fear was me allowing a demon to come in and talk louder than God. Was that your brain's interpretation or did someone straight up tell you like you had like demons in you? Well, I think as I got older and I started reading Frank Peretti books, I really not helpful. (laughs) Really felt like it was definitely a me problem. Um, I never watched horror movies or anything like that. Um, So really, Frank Peretti was my first kind of horror but I thought it was all very real. It was, it made sense to me that there was a spiritual war going on right outside of my body that was invisible to me most of the time. And that I had to pray away. I had to be strong or bold in the Lord or, you know, remember these Bible verses, these promises that were given to me as a child. Rebuke Satan. I I feel like this, to, I really resonate with this, Meg, because I had a very similar experience as a kid, not knowing how to say the things I was feeling, but knowing the ways I was feeling weren't okay, or that I wasn't okay. Yeah. And that sense of spiritual warfare was so deeply embedded and the idea of like the spiritual armor the sword of the yes. spirit a shield of faith okay there's a whole song i've got <laughs> like i'll sing it for you later um but this thing that happens with anxiety that is so normal for you when you're experiencing it for your whole life like i have and you have is you have intrusive thoughts mm-hmm. intrusive thoughts that you don't ask for that don't come from who you are really. And that can feel really, really confusing when our whole orientation is toward, I need to perform well so that I don't know, like I'm good for the reasons that church is telling me to be good or whatever. And if you veer out of that kind of norm that you're taught, you absolutely immediately think like, what am I doing wrong that I have this voice inside my head that's coming from somewhere I don't understand? Well, and it puts a on you. It's your fault if you didn't pray enough. It's your fault if you didn't believe enough. Like it, it, it's, and it's very terrifying, especially as a young person to feel like, well, I have these feelings and I'm feeling this way and I'm doing all the things that they're telling me to do. And I still 
feel that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, clearly you're a failure. Yeah. I think being a failure is one of the biggest fears that I had growing up. Probably still one of my biggest fears is failure. But to fail at being a good Christian girl was not like, to me, it was just never, I was not allowed. It was not going to happen. I wouldn't allow it to happen. I was going to just grit my teeth and shove it all down inside. Cause that was the other thing I started doing was just, you can't talk about it. So you have to deal with it. And the way that I dealt with it was to ignore it. Or so I thought I was ignoring it. I did not do a good job and not talk about it because it was a failure. You're right, Linz. It was an absolute failure. And when you get told scriptures like Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. I found hope. I did find hope in that verse. And I thought, okay, this is the promise. This is the promise to me. And I just need to find it, I think, was the goal. Yeah. It's interesting to think that like a verse like that, that should be so full of hope and promise could be like weaponized when it comes to mental health. And that's so like, devastating. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't really ever thought of it in that way, but how, if you don't feel that sense of hope, it sounds like you did for a while. Did it turn, do you feel like it turned at a certain point as you got older and the anxiety just never went away? Like when did you sort like, did prayer make you feel better for a time? And then after a while it felt empty? Like, how did that feel? Yeah. I feel like prayer when I was younger, at least prayer was a way to, you know, give your fears to the Lord. It was pass those off, but that only works for a really short amount of time because they're not gone. (laughs) They're right there in you. They're with you always. They're like Sarai is saying they're intrusive thoughts in your head all the time. I constantly thought that I was hearing demonic voices Um, I started hallucinating demons in my bedroom at night. I would do things like if I had to get up in the middle of the night, I was sure that there was something under my bed. And before you go there, I did not watch any movies that would have put these thoughts into my head. Well, because you weren't allowed to. I do find it's funny, like going back to Frank Reddy, I, it is hilarious to me. Like Gremlins, I remember was a big movie when I was younger and I was certainly not allowed to watch that, Mm -hmm. but then I could read all the Frank Peretti. Like Frank Peretti is terrifying. Like I was scared shitless from those books. And I just like the fact that that was okay because it was like scary stuff about the Lord, but like (laughs) not actual, oh, sometimes you don't even realize stuff until you're like, you know, right now I'm like, oh, that was... It was, it was Christian horror, right? It was like that's what yeah. it was. Horror totally. for the Lord. <laughs> horror for the Lord. <laughs> Don't say it too fast, or it sounds like horror for the Lord. <laughs> Sorry, I derailed. We'll get have a little. We'll get into whoring for the Lord later. That's yeah. another episode oh, for all sure together. That's an episode. Mm-hmm. Right I can't there. wait for that one. <laughs> that's gonna be good. <laughs> um. Oh, so you know, there's this verse that I remember from. I would say more kind of that middle school, high school age where I was starting to, you know, hang out more with my friends than my family and um, a lot of youth group, a lot of youth group activities and obviously getting into the NIV Bible. And this verse in Philippians fully said, do not be anxious about anything. And I did not know how to do that in the least. I had no framework for how to not be anxious. I had no understanding even really of what being anxious meant. Truly. Um, I always thought of being anxious as like, don't be anxious for, you know, your friend's supposed to be here at four o'clock and they're not here yet. And they get here at four ten. Well, don't be anxious about it. They'll get here. That's not anxiety guys. That's not, <laughs> that's not what I was experiencing. It's Probably not what any of us were experiencing, but it seemed like such a simplistic, easy answer. Just stop it. Just Just stop stop. it. Just stop. That's a, that's, I just want to remind us all, if you haven't seen this joke, there's a really wonderful clip from some old sketch show with Bob Newhart in it. And he's a, he's a 
<laughs> he's a therapist and he makes this lady pay before he gives her advice. Uh, and her thing is like, she's afraid of being buried alive. So she's got this anxiety. Yeah, that's horrible. It would be horrible. I wouldn't want it personally. Not Same. my favorite option for myself. <laughs> not really how I envision no. the plans the Lord has for me <laughs> to give me prosperity and whatever else. Um, but but she she's like, okay, okay, I'll do anything. And then he takes the money and he's like, okay, my therapy is very quick. And it uh, is only two words. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> And right? so that's what the Bible verse is saying. Basically, it's biblical for him to say. That. I mean, how many times I went up to an altar call or raised my hand during an altar call, not really even knowing how to articulate all of the things I was feeling. I had no vocabulary for it. And yet I was seeking support and I was seeking help and I was begging. I was begging for it. And I'd go up and I'd cry and I'd you know be at the altar call and I would give over my worries to the Lord and call upon Jesus to save me. And all of these things that I thought would be the solution. And I felt great at the altar. Oh, and altar catharsis cannot be beat. It's the best drug there is. It is. Literally delicious. Yeah. You get some out of body experience. You get some positive hallucinations you get so many good endorphins and the vibes of everyone and the laying on of hands. I don't think I was touched more than I was at the altar. Yeah. You know, we weren't a big hugging family. So even that human touch was something that I craved. And I feel like that's that, in the, but that's when the panic would set in mm. when I would stand up and turn around, tears dried on my cheeks walking back to my seat or the pew or whatever. And it all came flooding back. Oh, right away too. Like your euphoria just ended immediately. I mean, if it was, if it was a church camp and it was all youth, the music would keep going. Everything would keep going. It would keep going until I would break from the community, Mm -hmm. whether that's going back and sitting down and being alone in an aisle. Like a lot of times my friends would still be up there or some would leave. Or I just remember those moments when I would be alone, alone again with myself, with my thoughts, everything was back. And, and again, I would be the one who failed. Yikes. When the laying on of hands was happening, did you ever tell people what was going on for you? Was this an act like, did you talk about what was going on or oh, no. how you were praying for what you were praying for? No, there wasn't therapy yeah. sessions involved <laughs> yeah. at the altar. Everyone just heard from the Lord mm-hmm. um, and, you know, would kind of pray. I, I would say generic things, yeah. bring her peace you know, bring her comfort. If you would start to cry though, especially when you would get into like the heavy, can't catch your breath, you know, really emotional things. I think that that emotion helped the people who were praying over you to like guide them into where you needed to hear things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you lay hands on somebody and they kind of accept the human contact and then you start praying generically. And then maybe you say a word and you hear that sob come in or the shaking of the shoulders starts. And it, it is, you're just following your intuition down this little dark path and the person's emotional or physical responses are telling you as the person praying you're on the right path. Or if they get really quiet, you're like, left turn. Like, I guess I didn't quite hear from the Lord, but because you could, you know, blame everything on God, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Sometimes I think you could blame God for not like speaking loud enough to you or, Oh, I, I wasn't listening. Lord say it again. There's so many cop-outs I think, um, that I just felt like happen at the altar in particular. So one quick clarifying question for those who may not, I I don't know that every denomination does altar calls or what have you, like in some traditions, as far as I know, an altar call is just strictly you come forward to get 
saved. But other denominations, I feel like, really ran wild with the altar call and it sounding like, well, what were these altars? Were they asking you to just come forward if you needed prayer? Was it if you're, re- it was it a rededication? Like, sort of what is, what was it that you were responding to, just out of curiosity? Yeah. Um, I think a few times it was a rededication. You know, you kind of got lost on the path and you would think back into your week of, you know, potential sins that you had committed and you felt like, well, maybe Jesus needs to kind of save me, like re-up on my savior. Um, But other times it was really generic. It was if you need support, if you are seeking answers Uh, and those kind of altar calls, I think, were the most spectacular because you get a large group of people coming up to those, um, particularly at, at camps, at, at kids, kids, summer camps or kids, winter camps. Um, there was a lot more, at least where I went to the camp, a lot more altar calls. I mean, every service there was an altar call. Right. And there's a lot of peer pressure. Like it feels like you are celebrate. If you're one of the people that goes forward, like you are celebrated yeah. like it is you're doing the thing that they want you to do and it's funny we, Megan and I have talked about this a little bit before but I was not a big responder to altar calls <laughs> and so it's just interesting hearing that because I felt like well I was saved and I got baptized and like I'm I love Jesus and I'm good like I know I did go down a couple times or maybe there's prayer but my life was pretty chill and I, my anxiety disorder didn't set on until a little later in life. So that I knew of, I think I just stuffed it all down and just did, you know, I, yeah, it's just, it's so interesting to hear about. Cause I feel like I was more one of the people like, I'm going to go, I'm going to pray for all y'all. Yeah. Like I yeah. was in a position of like, I'm doing good. I'm fine. But like all you guys weeping at the front, like I'll come and Maybe nice. lay hands on you or something. I was like deeply uncomfortable with people like laying hands on you. I'm not a big toucher to this day. <laughs> so yeah, there was something about all of it that it was just like, and I don't then, know. Especially get, in the teenage world, you get the sweaty oh, palms. The sweaty boy And hands. the smells no, on your the, back. The BO that happened. Really like, happening by and you. And you're so close to everyone. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the other thing is the only time that you were really allowed to be close to the opposite sex was at an altar call. Yeah. I don't know. I found ways. <laughs> You were so, kind of so did I, but I didn't let myself believe that's what I was doing. Wow. Okay. Uh, just just me then looking for the laying on of hands at the altar? Uh, you were kind of an altar slut a little bit. Yeah. It sounds rude. like it. Yeah. Gosh, I had no idea. I feel like, see, to me, I feel like the cute boys did not, the boys that I wanted to be touched by were not responding to altar calls. They're the bad boys sitting in the back. That's like, fair. That's, they that's the boys. still touch you though, right? Like No, but they wouldn't go down there. Not the ones oh. I liked. I'm a, yeah, I'm they were in the kids. back where the lights didn't reach. <laughs> They're in the back row, probably, you know, <laughs> yeah. in the cry room. Thinking their out. sinful thoughts. That's right. Well, I'm kind of, I'm interested in this too, because my experience at my church with altar calls was, th- there wasn't even a reason for it. It was just like, mm. we'd, we'd sing three fast songs, <laughs> do offertory, have like special music. Some lady would get up in the church and oh, sing some music. song. I forgot. Yeah, I guess it wasn't always a lady. Sometimes it was dudes or whatever. Trios. My mom was a part of a trio. They were infamous. Actually, she was in two. It's a whole thing. But it was always after the sermon and... Oh, sorry. Before, after offering, we'd sing three slope songs, then the sermon, then they would, the worship team would slowly come back up oh, as the pastor was saying yeah. his final prayers. Oh, with the, it with starts really slow, quiet. quiet. It's, it's a, a quiet, quiet, quiet prayer yes, after right. the sermon. Yes. The worship team quietly like saunters back up. The piano player sits down and whoever else is, I mean, that's, we had some mm-hmm. instruments in my church. Right. The person speaks in a whisper tone. They do. And they're that's just right. like, we all get into that's a right. whisper. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so there, if, if God's yeah. if God's calling you right now, just like if you feel him mm-hmm. in your tugging on your heartstrings like that, <laughs> every head bowed, every eye closed. That was that was the church camp version of it. So that's for youth, really. But 
But truly, or like a revival service, if you ever got to have oh, that fun experience. Oh, I did. I uh-huh. did get yeah. to go to yeah. some revivals. Those ones were very much like, I see that hand, I see That's that right. hand. Um, a lot of people closing, getting saved, though, at oh, those. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a scam, to be honest, for the most part, because when you have to close your eyes and bow your head, everyone will see you if you're looking around. And I've definitely witnessed certain people be like, thank you, I see that hand, I see that hand, and no one's raising <gasps> their hand. What? It's manufactured peer pressure. No, because- literally. They don't lie. <laughs> oh, sorry. So I accidentally at church. that later. Uh, but spoiler, they do lie. And But the, wow. the other thing is that that like quiet, emotionally compelling, slow, just random chords playing. Are they and random they, though? Really? Are no, they random? Are they no. Were they practiced at, at practice before? Well, no, they're idiosyncratic depending okay. on who the leader is. So it's I can still think of the worship leader at my church growing up was a person who I still love. Her name is Cindy. And Cindy would go up and just play. And she plays this very specific way that also influenced how I play piano as well, of course, because that's what I heard every week for millions of years. And then sometimes they'd break into a slow song again and the altar would go. And then sometimes, but not every time, they'd pick it up with like a yes lord yes kind of a end Mm -hmm. like we're so happy the celebratory we had this catharsis and now everything's gonna be okay and then we'll see you next week and do it again yep ending on the high note was a really good vibe where everyone kind of then you get the energy back you get the mm -hmm. key change yes and you're just alive and vibrant and yeah definitely my anxiety was lessened What's the what was the one song that everyone was supposed to stand at the end? Like when they sing, there was like a worship song where oh was it? I stand, I stand in all of you. That one, yeah. It, I feel like that was like you were a really yeah. good Christian if you stood at that part. Well, it's telling song. you exactly right. how to be a good Christian. Yes. So you so. got to follow the rules in right. the song. Anyways, I we have derailed. Oh, Let's, no. I mean, this is actually an important segue for everyone that's listening. Just stay tuned for our worship CD. We're going to be putting out. <laughs> and it's a CD. It's not 100%. on Spotify or Apple yeah. Music or anything. It's yeah. just fully a CD in a jewel case, the full size jewel case. And there will case. be several episodes on worship music, the cringiest worship lyrics. Maybe you still like some worship songs. I Maybe don't know. you sing them to your spouse. Maybe you have a mug that says our dog is an awesome dog and you sing it to your dogs. Maybe you do. Dogs deserve that kind of adulation. They I do. agree. They do. I think for me, going down to the altar was also a panic anxiety moment. I had social anxiety. I probably still do. You see me at a party with people I don't know and I'm not going to be talking to a lot of people. I'm going to be in a corner talking to the one person that I do know. Um... But altar calls, I had to really feel the tug for little Meg to get up out of my seat, say, excuse me, probably. So that means talking to other people and then going down in the front. Now, I would never be a middle aisle walker. I always went to the outer aisles to walk down. Good strategy. Part of my anxiety. Um Also, I just didn't want to be front and center. Like, put Mm -hmm. me on the side of the altar where the lights don't shine. That's my place. Because really, truly, for me, especially young me, my relationship was personal. My relationship was me and God in my head. Also, me and demons in my head. You know, but I was told to really protect that relationship. And so I think, you know, somebody asked earlier if if you shared, you know, if I talked about what I was dealing with or going, that's also the odd thing. It could have been so easy, I think, to have leadership in the church be the people who were trained as counselors or trained therapists who would come and ask questions to help you do talk therapy at the altar, I think would have been so healing for me to be able to speak my fear and realize that maybe it didn't have the kind of power that I was allowing it to have. Because those are techniques that I've learned now in therapy um, that sometimes holding it in gives it the power and the control. One thing that occurs to me is like, because I'm like reliving altar experiences through everything you're saying, because I never talked about what was going on for me ever either. And no one ever asked. Right. Right. And I think part of the loneliness of that experience, like while you might be having an emotional release that you desperately need, and that's like the only context that it's kind of not going to freak everyone out around Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Or, no and maybe ever, the only healthy thing that's coming out of that experience. Like right. I do think that that emotional release is probably something that all these people desperately need. Yes. Yeah. And don't necessarily have a safe space to do. But then when there's no follow through, there's no actual communication about what's going yeah. on. Mm -hmm. When I was aging into like my late teens and early 20s, because my stuff started around like 11 years old and then kind of kept going real excitingly in some weird directions. But especially when I was early in college, I remember I have one of my best friends in college, her name is Faye. And we used to talk about this feeling we had that people knew us, but no one knew us because no one ever was interested or asking for anything under the surface. Mm. She also had a lot of anxiety too. And I didn't ever think I did, but I sure as hell did. <laughs> so, but the I think that too is like a really interesting part of that interaction at the altar is like there's a sense of support. Mm -hmm. There's a moment of connection with that touch and with people, you know, praying for you or speaking over you or whatever the tradition people were in doing. But there's still that empty place of I'm I'm not. I didn't tell anybody what I was dealing with because I didn't want them to think of me in some weird way that or I didn't as a want. Sinner. I didn't want them to think I was a sinner or yeah. wasn't enough or that I shouldn't have the, because I also was like a kid who was like, um, get me on the stage. I'm 10. I can lead worship. Let me do that. And they're like, sure, that's cute, I guess. You know, that kind of thing. So it was, yeah, I just, I think that loneliness though is a really important piece of this. To, and I'm interested in how that part of not being able to share or being asked to share or even having that opportunity affected you or if that was a part of your experience for that. Yeah. I mean, I think growing, I was definitely an introvert, obviously had social anxiety uh, and just major anxiety and depression. And I grew up in a home where we had two different families. Mm -hmm. We had the family at church who was loving, supportive. You know, my dad would take my mom's hand in the parking lot. And it didn't matter if 10 minutes before he was screaming or throwing something or yelling at all of us or saying horrible things to my mother. The moment that we got out of the car in that church parking lot, we were a good Christian family. Mm -hmm. And I think I was taught to protect that image. So if I was feeling anything that was related to my home life, there's no way that I would talk about it. There's no way that I would share that with anyone. No one was a safe adult in that scenario because first of all, everything is gossip. Apparently mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard to have to talk about an experience that I personally had without being told that I was gossiping or slandering someone. And so growing up in a home that was secret because of abuse, I think made it so that I would never talk about the things that were hurtful or harming me or causing me stress or anything. I, it was not allowed. My dad would not have allowed it. And he would have denied it. And he would have, I mean, we were probably being gaslit every single day of our lives. Um, and you know, it comes to a point where when you grow up with that, it is normal. And so it makes sense. Such a brutal combination. You know, I think that like that is just such a recipe for not letting your true feelings out about anything, you know, if that's what's modeled to you. And then there isn't that like the church should have been a safe space for you mm. to be imperfect and to you know, like be able to talk about like maybe your dad being horrible or whatever it is, you know? And I think that like that being modeled to you, like you have to be perfect walking in and those people expect you to like be able to pray to Jesus and all your stuff goes away. I think that like the type of church we were all raised in just glossed over some really big things. And I think that like, it's, it's just so bizarre because obviously I, you know, we intro it a little bit, like we're all in very different places. But like, when I look at like the person of Jesus and who I think he is, like he was so messy and, <laughs> you know, like he was willing to like talk about hard things with people and upend stereotypes. And like, that's why that's the only reason I'm still in it is because I'm like, okay, he was pretty cool. And he didn't do the thing that was expected of him. And it's just like, it just all of this the system that we were raised in just really lost the plot. And it just, obviously we are all 
working through so much of that now and it's ugh. it didn't have to be that way it just makes me so it makes me sad for you i'm sorry Meg. like i'm sorry that 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 was your experience and that you were seeking help and community and you you know you had these struggles and it was just yeah you got nothing back well i think the joy of it now is learning learning about myself now as an adult I've really been able to, as a 40 plus year old woman, be there for my younger self in a way that I didn't have. And that's what this podcast is really all about. It's about us being able to share our personal experiences. We all grew up in different cities and we all experienced really similar culturally Christian evangelical things that caused harm. And I think as women, as young girls in that community caused us harm in a way that is unique. It's unique to us as women. That's what we're going to be talking about. I think every episode we're going to come up against a trauma experience that one or all of us have had or have shared or friends that have had those experiences. And we're going to be the adult women for our younger selves. And we're going to support one another through that and learn things and hopefully grow from it and and heal is really what what I want to do. Is and create a community of healing. Because to be clear, it's yeah. not just unique to us. Like it there are a grip mm-hmm. of yeah. women who are and like whatever we'll we'll talk to men too. Oh yeah. But like being a woman in the evangelical church is a particular kind of experience. And if you grew up in the 80s and 90s in evangelical church, you will probably have some sense of understanding of what we're talking about. And we, I mean, that's what we want is to create a safe space for people to talk about their journey away from that toxicity. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, I'd like to add to that. I think it's really important to recognize that people who are queer or trans also had yeah. probably very similar and even more damaging kind of mind fuckery happening. Right. Well, they yeah. weren't even allowed to be they weren't allowed out or be themselves. Be we were allowed were. to be women in the church. We just yeah. didn't couldn't have positions well, of power. Were, and you or know. to have like a personality was also right. kind of a problem. Right. <laughs> right. It's like, or boobs. You couldn't oh, have those. Don't have boobs. <laughs> okay, listen, if I could give you the best advice to be a good evangelical girl, <laughs> person assigned woman at birth or female at birth, you do not grow boobs. Just don't, don't have them. don't have them. Oh, just don't do it. It's kind of it's the same with anxiety. You just don't do it. And yeah. don't have opinions of your own. Oh, uh-huh. gosh, no. Don't be no. in charge of stuff. No. Have a lot of well, babies. children. You can be in charge of the children. you like, got a place in children's ministry. That's right. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about mental health today. Well, that, that we has are. to do with it. And, you know, the Christian culture that perpetuates the negative stereotypes around mental health, it's a lot of, well, they're drug addicts. Or you only have what they would consider, I'm doing air quotes, uh, mental health if you had schizophrenia or, you know, they were only like the big ones, I guess I would mm-hmm, say that were mm-hmm. recognized. And those were more like, well, you should probably just institutionalize those people or it's demons. Yeah, and I'm, we're going I'm dead to serious. That's not a joke. That no. is a thing that I for sure thought or it's demon possession. Well, if you read, Which Bible, I was always terrified that I was demon possessed. And I was like, how do you know if you're just like hearing demons or if they're like literally possessing you? Like, what's the difference between those two <laughs> I never had that thought. And I did. Oh, I man. Did and so uh, you and Danielle, my sister, <laughs> you guys are very, she had a lot of those thoughts. Yeah. So I I did have hallucinations. I did see Jesus once in my closet. That's cool. That's nice um, of you to visit you there. Yeah. And I was like weirdly fine with was like a man. coming out of the closet? No, he was, sorry. Sorry to burst everyone's bubble. He was squarely in my closet. Um. But I was weirdly okay with that. Like, it's seeing, Jesus. Like, cool. right. But like, it cool. was like a man figure, like, in my closet. And guys, I watched a lot of Unsolved Mysteries when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. And I would go to bed. I lived in Southern California. Where we lived all on the a little, lived. yeah, we lived on a little cul de sac, but still, my bedroom window was at the front of the house. My brother and I's bedrooms were at the front of the house, and my parents was at the back. As a parent now, That's like the most terrifying thing for me to consider that my bedroom was right next to the driveway, 
which as you know, all kidnappings, like they would pull into the driveway, come right through my window. I'd be gone at night. Unsolved mystery. It is still unsolved. I remember this one night, this little girl was taken from her bedroom at night and again, unsolved. And my parents were like, good night. So here I go, you know, trotting off to my bedroom, locking the window, just hiding under the canopy bed. And I think, I mean, to this day, I still sleep with the closet door shut. Like I don't like the closet doors being open because the closet door was open, but it was Jesus there. But I was like, it's fine if I'm nine and there's like a man figure in my closet, as long as he looks like a white Jesus, it's fine. They were Maybe good. white Jesus was there to protect you. Well, that's what I assumed. Yeah, he obviously. beat up a kidnapper or something. He didn't really speak to me, though, which I was really bummed about because I kept going, look, I know some people that have claimed that they have heard the audible voice of God. And I was just like, I mean, you're already here. Why wouldn't you also talk? But then I felt like I was being greedy. Like you get the visual or you get the audible. You don't get both. No, he was being withholding. And that's not (laughs) cool. Jesus has some therapy to work through, too. So I had some hallucinations. Uh, and one time as a young child, I, I now as an adult, I realize I think it was my first panic attack. And I didn't realize this until I was talking about this episode with my husband and I started articulating like what this experience was like and how many times I still can feel the same sensations that I had in my fingers and my hands at the time. And as I was describing it, I realized, oh, wait. I do know what was happening. I was having a panic attack and um, my parents took me to the hospital and I had an MRI or a CAT scan. I don't remember what. I was young. I was probably elementary school, maybe fourth grade. So maybe nine. And it was late. It was dark. um, And I was seeing things. I thought I could feel things. I was playing chess and I could feel the chess pieces and I would talk about them but I had never really been taught how to play chess and I was hearing things. And then I was seeing demonic, what I would describe as demonic looking things. Some were snaky, some were bat like they were just creatures, very like black oozing. And this was pre Frank Peretti for me. It sounds like someone had been reading the oath. (laughs) So was there a lot of black ooze, right? It was like, yeah, yeah, this yeah. was, this was like, um, I would say it was more like a smoke mm. black ooze, like tar, but like not oozy. It wasn't like puddly. It was like shaped. It was formed. It was wild, yeah, like wild. absolutely yeah. bonkers wild. And I was crying. It was terrifying. And I think, I, I don't know. I, honestly, I would have to call my mom to ask if they found anything or did, but I, it, it, that was it. We went to the hospital. It was yeah, this give horrible you, like, night. Any medication? Any- I'm sure that they probably gave me something to calm me down. Yeah. Um, I don't remember any of that. And then, you and know, how it was, were you again? I think about nine. And then I think it was just over mm-hmm. and no one spoke about it. Oh gosh. There was no conversation afterwards. There was no follow-up of like therapy was a definite not going to happen. Did they even have therapy in the 80s? I don't know if they did, honestly. (laughs) If they did, I didn't know about it. Had it been invented? (laughs) Well, I wasn't, I wasn't crazy enough, I think. You know, it wasn't schizophrenia. Like the only mental health that was recognized or okay or like, you know, you had to be real bonkers for the church to go, yeah. Okay, I think you need some help. I no offense, but visual hallucinations are pretty heavy duty shit. Right? So yeah. like that yeah. is not yeah. a usual childhood experience <laughs> for most people. Yeah. I I am curious, and this is like maybe something that we should research or, you know, ask our audience if and when we have one. <laughs> um, is that if people growing up outside the church, like was therapy more normalized? Is that just something that has uh, clearly, it has become more normalized in our society, but specifically in evangelical Christendom. Like, that's all we know. And all of our experiences, that was not a thing. 
in our lives. I mean, the first time that I went to anything like therapy was when it was court ordered when my parents were getting divorced. Mm. Oh, wow. And I had to go to a mediator or something where they, I was too young to decide what I wanted to do. Uh, but there was a mediator for the judge who sat me in a room. I had to go to the police station for this. It was terrifying. It was not comforting or like my first therapy experience was, so was this, not. This was in California. This was in California. Do you know if that was court, uh, like the standard for all divorces or was this just their like. You know, I've only been or... through one divorce in my life. So <laughs> I I'm, just, I'm just curious. <laughs> like I have again. I don't know, but. When our podcast really takes off, we'll have an intern that's um, Googling these things as we Perfect. And then we talk. We'll get them to. And then the reference will be like, yes, all divorces in California (laughs) had court ordered therapy. And all the children did it at police stations. Yes. (laughs) That's. Yeah. But it was one. It was not like therapy, like ongoing as we think of therapy. It was one time where they took me into this tiny room by myself with a stranger who I had never met before. Sounds super safe. Sounds and there like were no r- windows in this room. Mm. It was not like an interrogation room, but like, I don't know. It probably sounds was. like an interrogation room. <laughs> yep. Are you sure they weren't just interrogating you? <laughs> yeah, this sounds horrible. I don't know. I, and then And then I said I didn't want to live with my dad. And they were like, cool, you have to live with him for the summer. Bye. Oh, like it was I don't understand. I don't understand any of that. I, I'm like, don't ask me if you're not going to listen right. to what I would like as a child. Anyways, this so, was my experience so with therapy. Really? Yeah. You the cards were really stacked against you in the like in therapy. Yeah, like, definitely. Like the church plus. wasn't encouraging it. The yeah. divorce situation probably made it even more traumatic. Seeming. Yeah. Yeah. And and the only time, again, that I was like allowed to talk about my parents' divorce or what that meant for me was to a stranger when it was deciding who had custody of me. So mm-hmm. my, my husband's parents got divorced when he was 10 and he went to therapy, but like regular therapy sessions afterwards that I assume were his mother's idea, but he was raised in a like agnostic atheist home. And so interesting being married to someone who's raised so t- whenever I bust out into some worship songs, he has <laughs> no idea. It's very oh, frustrating. Sad. Yeah. It, it's um, sad for him. I yes. mean, we have a great time, but yeah. Right. Like who guy. doesn't know our God as an awesome God? Like who come on. Know? And so, but it, th- it's interesting because he's my own, uh, he's the only person I know that like went to therapy as a child. Hmm. And I'm like, Oh, that's nice. For yeah. You. I, I would have, <laughs> I would have considered therapy would have been a good thing for a child of divorce or like you guys said, probably when you're having hallucinations and like physically think there's things that are there that aren't there, that maybe that's an opportunity to ask some probing questions. Like ideally, you know, (laughs) it would be okay to check on that. Just ask a few things about it and see what's up. Even just have a conversation. Let's just start with have a conversation about it. Well, and to be fair, I'm sure my mom wanted to talk about it or brought it up to me or, you know, she's very loving and I'm sure followed up in that way of, are you feeling that again? Have you, have you experienced that again? But also it was so terrifying. I don't know if I ever would have been honest about it. Right. Because I didn't want to relive it. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want, because it was so out there. It was just, did you, did you feel Christian guilt with it too? Like, was that, was it just straight fear or was there also like, if I admit to like really what I saw that, that it like, did it feel like, well, I was really concerned that I was possessed. Mm -hmm. I was really concerned that something was taking over my mind Mm -hmm. and that I wasn't going to be in control. And that's what I prayed for. I prayed for God to be in control of my mind, to take over my thoughts, to only, you know, hear or see or do things that he wanted me to do. There was a lot of guessing that happened and, and a lot of, you know, shoving it down, ignoring it, pushing it away, acting as though it never happened. So much denial about this that did not help. It just compounded as I matured. One of the themes that I feel like for me in my life and in my journey through and out of evangelical Christianity and religion altogether 
and I hear it coming up in this story a lot, is this kind of like sort of division of of a person into multiple pieces. It's like mm-hmm. fracturing where we are born and put into a scenario that is so deeply disempowering to human beings. I never thought of my own agency. I never thought I had the ability to assert myself, mostly because I got in trouble every time I tried. I'd also just like to make a disclaimer. Like, I know my parents did their best, too. Like, I love my parents, and I have a lot of compassion for them. And I know their parents probably did better than their parents before them, too. So we're all in this evolution together. Amen. And that's, Mm -hmm. you know, let's have some compassion for people who also were raised in weird circumstances and have their own stuff going on. Um, But... I, I think that this sense of either my mind is being taken over by demons or God is fighting for my mind and he will control my thoughts and be this thing for me so completely removes Meg from the conversation, right. so completely re- removed Sarai from the conversation. It was not even a question of like, this is my fucking brain. Mm -hmm. Like I get to be a part of this conversation Mm. too. Or what do I want? Or what What do do I I need? Yes. You know, not finding myself for so long was a, a harm that came out of this that I didn't realize. Yeah. Not knowing who I was, not being able to have my own identity is something that has taken a very long time. My, my lack of self-confidence and and I know we'll get deeper into physical things and like what be, growing up as a girl in this culture has, you know, done to us, um, purity culture in particular, but not knowing who I am, not who I'm as a woman, not who I am as a daughter or a mother or a wife or a friend, but who I am and the things that I want to put my energy towards. And that was never encouraged or glorified or applauded it was squashed. Yeah. Women are instruments and women fade into the background, but women make sure everything happens. And I don't know what it was like for, for people assigned male at birth growing up in this kind of a situation, but I don't think it was the same. Uh, in fact, I know it's not the same yeah. in all of the conversations I've ever had. Um, you know, it wasn't great, good for them either, but right. it wasn't the same kind of please disappear. And if you take up space, that means you're bad Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't, you should not take up space. You shouldn't ask for too much. My, that, that message is reinforced over and over again. Or if a boy looks at you a certain way, it's your fault. Everything's your fault. Because of how you dress or what, whatever it is, it's always on you. You have to, and as a part, like, uh, again, I don't know you that well, Sarai either, but we all seem like people who have tendency we we want to be good we want to be we're, we have some perfectionistic tendencies and i think you put that kind of personality and all of us are pretty different and have come out of this and, and we clearly have landed in different places <laughs> but and, and i think that this will be a really interesting exercise because i still have a lot of questions why i've landed where i have what about my personality because my sisters also we talk a lot about this stuff and how we each have kind of landed in very different areas as well but had the same upbringing Mm -hmm. went to the same churches and what about it of my personality saved me Mm. literally it was prophesied over me at one point that i was a doubting thomas wow and like someone spoke those words over me and at the time i was so embarrassed did you believe it yes yeah because i you i 12 or 13. Wow. Did you identify with it? Did you see it like, oh yeah, that is my sin? I I did and I was embarrassed by it at the time because, you know, my sister next to me is getting like prophesied that she's like a warrior woman for God. It was literally something like those words. And, but... So, ne- can I ask a clear? Was this spoken to just to you or was this like on a microphone to the congregation? No, it was just to me. Okay. A woman prayed over me and prophesied it. But of course, with like my family, you're supposed to like report, what did she prophesy? You know, she yeah. told me she had a prophecy for me. And now I look back and I think me being a doubting Thomas saved me. Like mm-hmm. it, uh, being a skeptic, I am a naturally skeptical person. And I think it like saved me from like buying into some of the more damaging aspects. That's the only thing that I can get gather. No, like, and I'm 
genuinely so happy for you that you did not well, like, have to go through that. Why didn't I go that? down to the altar? Like I just, I why was, it you? made yeah. me deeply uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think that like, I'm a stubborn person. And when something makes me uncomfortable, I'm like, I am not going to do that. I'm, and I'm a confident person, but this like, is like I firstborn energy that I don't possess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's something about, it's just, whereas like my poor middle sister, like, whew, she was like, but and she was always my mom's favorite, you know. Is like again, no offense. Like disclaimer, she was like very listen, spiritual. Like, we, love our, we love our, we love, we love our moms. Right. My sister is my well, they, family's unanimous. They favorite, connected so. on a deeply spiritual level. My yeah. sister ate, was so much more sensitive and was having like more, like so much more anxiety and visions like you. And I just wasn't, I mm. wasn't like that. I'm a very black and white thinker. Yeah. Anyways, I I derail, but yeah, it. I think we that love this a derail. Be, <laughs> yeah, derail all day. And I think that like just this. I think obviously people out there who've been through similar things. Everyone is going to have landed differently, and everyone's personalities. There's going to be things that yeah. There's going to be things that have that shielded us, and then mm-hmm. I think also things that like probably it, with our unique personalities like made it cause more harm. And I think that we. 100% we have all been harmed by the evangelical church there. That's the truth. And I think that like unpacking that and also hearing from others yeah, and how, and how and why they've left is sort of what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, Meg, what brought you to find help for this? Finally, now that you're a full grown <laughs> warrior woman, like what made you seek help for anxiety and, and what helped you kind of get along that path? Yeah. Honestly, I feel like being a mom, is what did it for me. I didn't get diagnosed until after I had gone through it with my son. Mm -hmm. And getting him help was such a huge priority for us. And I've learned this about myself through this experience that I have done so many things for so many other people and sacrificed knowing myself, learning about myself, being confident in who I am and walking my son through this process to get him help. And then hearing a psychiatrist say, wow, he really got the double whammy with both of you because my husband and I were both undiagnosed and have since been diagnosed and have been liberated and have found such freedom in these diagnoses. They're not harming us like they were because I take fluoxetine now. (laughs) And you know, having these conversations with our kid, with our family, we're so open about it. We're open about when we're having a depressed day, when we just need to not have any responsibility. And there's days where I take like self-care time now, which is wild that I sometimes do it once a week (laughs) is is where I'm at right now. Um, My husband's always encouraging me to do it more and, and I'm learning to. I'm learning to meditate. Um, I'm learning confidence in just who I am. And, and I'm taking drugs. Like I obviously have a lack of certain things going on in my brain and my body and I need supplement. And so I have found a lot of freedom in that. And I talk about it. I talk about my mental health. We talk about it all the time. It's not a secret. I talk about it at work. I talk about it with, you know, friends. It's something that is not a negative secret. It's just a reality. And I think hopefully what these last two years during a global pandemic have taught a lot of us is that we all have to think about mental health as part of our holistic health approach in life. Mm -hmm. And whether you're diagnosed or not, whether you need medication, uh, don't need medication, we all are going to have hard times. We're all going to have hard days. We can't always just pray it away. And whether you're religious or not, I think that that's important to know. Like, I think that we're starting to see that, that hopefully religion is embracing mental health and medication Mm -hmm. and understanding like it's okay to, if you are a religious person, it is okay to admit that Jesus cannot do it all. Mm. Like you take ibuprofen when you have a headache and you can take Lexapro if you have anxiety, you know, like we're all, I believe we're all on some form of medication here, you know, like it, that's, 
that's okay. And it doesn't make you a failure. And right. I hate that that's a message that a lot of us have gotten and hopefully we can. Well, and sometimes people don't have to be on it all the time. There are seasons for us. Postpartum depression is one that we don't talk about. And I'm pretty sure I had undiagnosed postpartum depression. All of the things that I experienced and, and I mean, just sobbing moments of sobbing in what was supposed to be the most joyous time of my life with Oof. a newborn baby. I mean, we're not putting the focus on the things that are going to heal us when we don't talk about mental health. Yeah. I know the church is making some, I shouldn't say the church, the culture of religion in our country, I know is making some steps forward. Lindsay, you talked about it. And I think praying for our mental health, praying for doctor's wisdom, mm -hmm. those are all things that I hear now that I didn't ever hear before. Um, knowing that there is science and there are smart people who study mental health and understand it in a different way, being able to seek out their guidance. I know that the church is way more supportive of that. The culture is way more supportive of that. But there are still stigma. There's still stigma around psychiatric help, around not going to just a spiritual therapist or a pastor, but seeking out non-spiritual counseling and then using chemicals. I, there's still stigma around medication for mental health within the church community. And I do hope that we're going to evolve as a culture in America. We're all Americans here. So I'm going to be uh, American centric for a sec. But even globally, I want this conversation to be one of revelation and one of enlightenment and not one that causes all that fear. And I really do think that if God does have those good plans for us and he does want to give us a future and a hope for me, at least right now, that means starting with me and not looking to some outside source to give me that hope and to create the perfect future for me. But I get to choose where I put my energy. And right now it's in this podcast with you lovely ladies. I mean, damn girl, that's the best sermon I've heard in a minute. <laughs> that's right. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And we're just going to close this out. I would walk down to the altar. Meg called me right me now. Too. I would be like, we are going I'm come to on down. Get some diagnoses going here. That's right. I'd like for you to come and get a prescription yep. for whatever SSRI is right for you today. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Meg Weber. I'm Lindsay Stranigan. I'm Sarai Johnson. And this is Holy Ghosting. Holy Ghosting is a same team media production. Music by Weep Bar. AP Weber produced the show. We'd like to give a special thanks to Meredith Hawley and Eris Conflict Resolution for consulting with us about our stories. If you have a story of abuse and you're worried about telling it publicly, they're available to help you tell your story in a way that keeps you safe. Find them at erisresolution.com. Thanks for joining us. And if you miss us in between shows, you can find us on socials posting almost every day at Holy Ghosting Pod, Instagram and TikTok. We hope you'll come back for our next episode, or maybe we'll see you in line at the pharmacy.